Hello, welcome back to this latest installment of the 12 Days in March review series for Step 1. This is Karen Malur returning again to introduce our first in this three-part video series that will focus on our dear friend, the brachial plexus, a notoriously frustrating topic for students to master on Step 1. As so many of us know, the brachial plexus is quite a meaty topic, and therefore, to maximize the absorption of this information, I've divided this review into a three-part video series with each part honing in and focusing on a different portion of the brachial plexus as demonstrated on this graphic. In part one today, I'll be introducing the brachial plexus and the roadmap that we'll be utilizing throughout this review. Once completed, we'll return our attention to the long thoracic and musculocutaneous nerves. This is gonna be a good one, let's jump in. Recall that the brachial plexus is an intricate network of nerve fibers that provide sensory and motor innervation for the skin and musculature of the upper extremity, including the shoulder, arm, and hand. The plexus is formed by the anterior or ventral rami of the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th cervical spinal nerves, as well as the 1st thoracic spinal nerve. The brachial plexus is divided into five main parts, roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. This can easily be remembered by the acronym REACH to drink cold beer or Rowdy Tom drinks cold beer. Use whatever acronym works for you, but just remember, B is always beer. Injuries to the brachial plexus is the topic most frequently tested on step one because it requires you to know the anatomy and be familiar with how specific lesions in the brachial plexus translate into characteristic clinical findings. In this series, we will emphasize the pathoanatomic approach favored on step one. The board examiners tend to focus on the five terminal branches of the brachial plexus. These include the musculocutaneous nerve, the axillary nerve, the radial nerve, the median nerve, and finally the ulnar nerve. The long thoracic nerve is commonly tested as well, but this is not a terminal branch of the brachial plexus. Remember, each of these nerves has a specific sensory motor, and proprioceptive function that you should be familiar with. Nailing questions on step one will require that you are familiar with the course of these nerves as they leave the spinal cord, the muscles and dermatomes they innervate, and the deficits produced with particular nerve lesions. In this video, we will now return our attention to the long thoracic and musculocutaneous nerves. In the next few slides, I'll cover all the high yields related to these nerves and some of the key buzzwords and phrases examiners love to use when asking questions related to these two nerves. Let's begin our discussion of the long thoracic nerve. Unlike the other nerves, this is not a terminal branch of the brachial plexus. It derives directly from the C5 to C7 nerve roots exiting from the spinal cord and travels inferiorly along the lateral chest wall going on to innervate the serratus anterior muscle. Recall, the primary role of the serratus anterior is protracting and upwardly rotating the scapula. The superficial course of the nerve leaves it very susceptible to injury from trauma or stretch. For step one, you will see vignettes that talk about long thoracic nerve damage in the setting of mastectomies and lymph node dissections. The proximity of breast tissue and lymph nodes to the serratus anterior leaves this nerve quite susceptible to injury. And here's the classic image to keep in mind. Injury to long thoracic nerve produces the wing scapula. This will be described on step one as a dorsal and medial protrusion of the scapula when a patient is asked to lean against a wall with arms outstretched as seen in this image. Now let's introduce the brachial plexus roadmap that we'll be using throughout this video series to help better contextualize exactly where lesions are occurring and which nerves are affected. We will be investing our time and energy on the terminal branches of the brachial plexus which are shown on the far left of this image. These terminal branches can easily be remembered by the acronym, many alcoholics must really urinate. M for musculocutaneous, A for axillary, M for median, R for radial, and U for ulnar. Let's finish up this introductory video by talking about the first of the five high yield terminal branches of the brachial plexus to know for step one, the musculocutaneous nerve. This nerve derives from the C5 to C7 roots and the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. It courses down the anterior part of the arm to innervate three muscles in the anterior or flexor compartment of the arm, including the biceps, the brachialis, and the coracoradialis. Let me emphasize that the motor component in the arm will ultimately become the big ticket item for the purposes of step one. 
but let's review the sensory distribution, which includes sensation to the lateral forearm, including the distribution from the elbow to the wrist as noted in the graphic. So remember, think lateral cord and lateral forearm for the musculocutaneous sensation. Moving on to key pathoanatomy, based on this brief discussion, how would you expect an injury to the musculocutaneous nerve, namely a traumatic injury, to manifest? Correct. Injury to the musculocutaneous nerve will result in loss of elbow flexion, forearm supination, and sensory loss at the lateral forearm. And this makes perfect sense based on our understanding of the muscles in the arm that the musculocutaneous nerve innervates. Here's a summary slide of all the key take-home points. Remember, for the musculocutaneous nerve, remember two big words, lateral and flexion. It arises from the lateral cord and is responsible for lateral sensation of the forearm. For step one, remember its primary role is flexing the elbow. And that's it. Thanks for tuning into part one of this three-part series. Don't forget to tune into parts two and three as we continue our brachial plexus adventure. See you soon. This is Kieran Malour signing off.